Tonight I'm honored to present Liberty Science Center's 2015 Genius Award to our first nominee, nom nominee Vint Cerf. His numerous other honors include the U.S. National Medal of Technology, the Turing Award, popularly known as the Nobel Prize of Computer Science, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Let's take a look at the video. Hi, I'm Vince Cerf. I am a father of three children, David and Bennett, and, well, the Internet. And like any good father, I'm going to bend your ear with a story about my kid. When the Internet was in its infancy, it was small and easy to deal with. It was a U.S. Defense Department project managed by Bob Kahn and me. After research at Stanford on packet network interconnection protocols, Cerf moved on to the Department of Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, we tackled the basic problem. We've got these different kinds of networks. They're different packet sizes, different speeds, different rates, different error rates, and everything else. How are we going to hook them together and make them all look uniform? That was the internet problem. Surf has been finding solutions ever since. At MCI, he went on to lead internet-based solutions for delivering data, information, voice, and video. The internet, it has been stunningly resilient. It has grown by a factor of a million or more since it was first turned on in 1983. And Surf has been there every step of the way, winning innumerable awards and honorary doctorates. Surf now has the great title of Chief Internet Evangelist at Google. This is not a static system. This thing is still evolving, even though the design was done 40 years ago. It has evolved over that period of time, and it continues to change. That's the one thing that makes this network so unusual. It wasn't designed to do anything in particular. And that's why it's been able to do almost anything we can think of to program. Because what Surface thought of has virtually changed all of our lives, and in the process given new meaning to the phrase, surf the net, Liberty Science Center proudly honors Vinton G. Surf. <laughs> OK, Google. How windy is it right now? The wind speed in San Francisco is now 51 miles per hour from the west. <laughs> Looking good. Mr. Surf, for your pioneering work in advancing the most important technology of our time, it is, gives me great pleasure to present you with Liberty Science Center's Distinguished Genius Award. This is really in a remarkable honor, and I really appreciate it. And the video was very amazing. I had no idea that you'd put all that together. First of all, um, I had no clue that the Liberty Science Center existed. I feel like an idiot. <laughs> and so now I've discovered, my god, New Jersey actually has something of interest here. <laughs> wow, I got to come back. <laughs> and, you know, what Paul has done is to turn into reality a vision that, it, that simply um, sort of grows the natural scientist in young people, which we wreck with a lot of our normal educational practices. And so, first of all, I'm going to do everything I can to help you accomplish your objective now that I know that you're here. The second thing I wanted to observe is that not everyone necessarily needs to be a scientist or a programmer or a mathematician, but everyone needs to learn what those disciplines are about because it will teach them a way of thinking that will serve them in almost any business or any career that they choose to undertake. And so that's why this center is so important. It's because it will create this capability in these young people that will serve them no matter what career they choose. And I think Paul and all, the, all of you who support this deserve enormous credit for investing in this and making it a reality. Thank you. Thank you. So Vince, since you're up here, I couldn't resist 
asking you some questions about things I've read recently that have been occupying your mind. You've talked about the digital, digital dark age, where future generations may have little or no knowledge of the 21st century. What is your fear? So here's a simple explanation. Every one of you uses software every day. And in the course of doing that, you create fairly complex digital files, whether it's a spreadsheet or perhaps a text document or a presentation or something else. Those complex digital files can be preserved. Their bits can be moved from one medium to another. But 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now, it's possible that the application software that knows what those bits mean won't work anymore because the operating systems will long be gone or the uh, software hasn't been updated to, uh, to operate in the newest machines that are available a thousand years from now. So the problem we have is that if we don't preserve the software, even if we preserve those bits, we won't knew, know what those bits mean. And so finding a way to assure that our bits are meaningful a thousand years from now or more is what I worry about. And if we don't solve the problem, we really will be in a digital dark age, and that's not a place that any of us want to be. Thank you. Tell me about the project you've worked on with the intriguing title, The Interplanetary Internet. So uh, I've had a pleasant uh, opportunity to chat with one of our astronauts uh, this evening, two of them actually. <clears throat> about 1998, my colleagues at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I started thinking about what might be needed 25 years from then in order to support manned and robotic space exploration. And we observed that the internet was doing a pretty good job of helping getting everything all interconnected, getting all kinds of computers and sensors and everything else linked. So we thought, why not extend this idea to go all the way across the solar system? And so we began designing protocols that would allow that to work. And in fact, we've gotten very far along in the project. We have the prototype software running on the rovers on Mars. We have them in the orbiting satellites. We have them on the International Space Station. We even have them in a spacecraft called Epoxy, which is in orbit around the sun and has visited two uh, comets in the last decade. So our purpose here is not to build this giant interplanetary network and hope somebody will come. What we're trying to do is to make sure that the uh, nations, the spacefaring nations, have an opportunity to adopt software that would make all the spacecraft interoperable. So that even if they don't use them, the, those protocols for the initial uh, scientific experiments, if they have the ability to run those protocols and when they complete those uh, scientific missions, the spacecraft, if they're still operating, can be repurposed to become nodes of an interplanetary backbone. And so over the decades to come, we literally can grow an interplanetary backbone to support communication that will be needed for manned and robotic space exploration. So can we put John's paper back up here? You know, while you're up here, Vint, I thought you could help me try to understand this. Let's zoom in on, like, the abstract. Okay, in this paper, we develop a cascadic multigrid algorithm for fast computation of the Fiedler vector. Can you help me with this? Well, I used to be a mathematician in my undergraduate days at Stanford, and I joined the American Mathematical Society. But after about five years, I realized not only did I not understand what the papers were saying, I didn't understand the titles. <laughs> So this one looks like it is going after um, an optimization tactic, uh, making use of um, the, the uh, what am I looking for here? I want to find the, <laughs> the, right the eigen, it's, it's, it's the eigen, yeah, you can help me with this. The, the eigenvalues are really important properties of matrices, and they help you find invert, inversions and so on. Um, so I'm guessing that this is an optimization trick, but did I get that sort of close? All uh, right. Okay. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> let's give it up for Vint Cerf. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much.